So I just heard we can start. Um, we had some troubles with the video and with the audio, but that should now work. Uh, welcome to my talk, Trust as the Foundation of DevOps. Um, if you're wondering, that guy who talks about trust must be a psychologist or a sociologist, something that qualifies me to talk about trust. Um, actually not. I'm just a developer. Uh, my name is Dirk Lehmann, and I, use, uh, I work for SAP uh, since quite a long time, and I work uh, in teams. That, uh, I worked in teams that were doing good, and I worked in teams that were doing really very good, like high-performing teams. And uh, so I asked myself, why is that? Why are some teams like doing good, and other teams are doing like really extraordinary good? And so I asked my colleagues. Why do you think that is? Why are we doing that good? Why are we so passionate about what we do? Why do we have so much fun? Why is the outcome so good? And then I asked other teams inside SAP that claimed the same, that yeah, we're really good, and um, I said, okay, why do you think that is? And then I asked people and teams outside of SAP, like also people that claim, yeah, we are really like good, we're in the flow, we work good, and I said, why do you think that is? And sooner or later, it was all these uh, conversations, the people talked about trust. They said, well, I trust my colleagues. It's a very trustful environment. I trust the expertise of my colleagues and, and such things. And so I thought, there must be something to this trust thing. There does something with the culture of teams that I want to know more about it. And then I read books, I read books and um, uh, blogs and did a lot of conversations. And the, the result of that research, so to say, is that talk, what you hear today. Um, so first of all, as I said, I'm quite a long time with SAP. So it's uh, almost 19 years now. Um, been in all kinds of teams, uh, mostly development, sometimes operation. I was very happy when this DevOps came up because then I knew, well, that's what I'm doing somehow, somewhere in between the development and the operations. Um, I established with a team the first daily deliveries at SAP. That was 2014, where you said, well, the daily deliveries in 2000, 2014, not that a big deal, right? You might be right, um, but for a company who used to deliver, um, or that is claims that we are shipping the largest monolithic software in the world um, that used to ship um, once a year, maybe twice a year. Um, the fast ones at that time uh, went uh, um, every quarter, shipping software to the customers every quarter. Going down to daily was, was a big step. Um, I'm co-organizing DevOps Day Zurich, so if you can't get enough of DevOps Days, um, the next DevOps Days in Zurich are on the September 8th, 9th uh, in Zurich, so you are invited to come and get more of the DevOps Days and more of the DevOps idea. Um, I'm a conference speaker, um, and I would be very happy if you would like to follow me on Twitter. My Twitter handle is at Durgen. Before I talk more about trust, let's first, I always think it's a good, to have, good to have a baseline of what was our understanding of what DevOps is. And I put some quotes here of some DevOps thought leaders, masterminds, whatever you want to call these persons, um, how they, what they think what DevOps is. And you can read through all of that and I think they are true with what they say. Um, but even these people have a hard time of defining DevOps, and the simple reason and explanation for that is that there is no real canonical definition of DevOps, right? Uh, actually, it already starts with the word, right? DevOps is very exclusive. It talks about development and operations. Just purely the term is very exclusive. It leaves, it leaves a lot of people out. If you want to create a service or create a product just with development and operations, I don't think that will work. You know, you have to have security people inside, design people inside, business people inside, someone who tells you what the customer actually wants. Um, yeah, security business and all these people. So the term is actually really bad. I mean, it, it started, and Manuel already had this this morning, over 10 years ago in, in Ghent, where they had a conference um, on how is the intersection of development and operations, how could we, how could we improve that? And because it was a two days conference, then it was the DevOps days, and from that it was the DevOps. And, um, but I think um, at some point in time it turned out that it's exclusive. We are leaving out important persons. And now you can do the DevSecOps, or the SecDevOps, or the DevBizOps, whatever have you. But for me, DevOps, it's like always like you have to think from the aha moment to the ka-ching moment. 
The aha moment is the moment where you think about what the product, the service shall look like. And the ching moment is like when the end user uses it or maybe even pays for it. Right? And everything in between that value stream, everyone who's involved, who's working, focuses on that value stream, on that product, you should have in mind when you think about that's all the people that we need to talk about when we do the DevOps thing. So DevOps is a bad term in my perspective, but the best one we have, and it took off, we can't change it anyway, so we have to live with it, but just have an understanding of what I understand with DevOps. And we have Ken here, and I always have like a slide of him with a, with a quote from that he put it in one of his blogs years back, I think. Um, when we talk about DevOps, we talk about a culture where people, regardless of title or background, work together to imagine, develop, deploy, and operate a system. And uh, even though there is no canonical definition of DevOps, this one is pretty good, right? So um, yeah, we should use that when we do some kind of DevOps transformation, move, whatever you want to call this. But because when you do, um, most silos or functional teams start thinking about, yeah, we should work closer in closer collaboration with the customers. We should do more design thinking to, to reach that. Yeah, you should do that. Why not? Or maybe we should revamp the whole Agile thing, rethink about Scrum, how we could do that better, or maybe some Kanban thing. Maybe we should have a look into Lean back. That's, yeah, you should do that. But when you look at it from the DevOps perspective and what I've just said, it's like you are optimizing the silos here, right? We believe that mostly what your operations folks are doing and what your business people are doing, it's actually already quite good. Not, not to say that you couldn't improve that, you could always improve things, but just if we just think they know their shit and they know how to do things, like what's the problem? How well could we optimize? Well, in between that, right? Like, who are these folks communicating with each other? And sometimes they are not communicating, or communicating very ineffectively, or collaborating and working together ineffectively. So we have to overcome this, and have to overcome these silos that they work better together, and they need to establish trust for that. Now that might be a big step, like, um, like why, why does it come now to trust? Okay, it's with communication, but why, why trust? Well, if we leave trust out of the game, and just say there is no trust in an organization or a team, then I would say the non-existence of trust is the root of all that's evil, right? So if you don't have trust in a team or an organization, you will have all kinds of problems for free on top. You just get them. And you doesn't, might, it mustn't, doesn't might even look like trust problems, but actually they are trust problems. This comes from a, from a book by, by Patrick Lincioni. It's called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team, where he um, pinpoints out like what are the dysfunctions in teams and well, like what are the root causes. And um, at, the, at the very bottom what you see is that he says um, an absence of trust is like the root cause for so many problems that we see uh, or dysfunctions that we see in teams. Like people that don't experience trust in their organization or their team, they do not go into conflicts, right? So they are, you won't get their opinion, their knowledge on a thing and so you might, do, you might make decisions without having um, their um, expertise in that decision. So the people are not really um, committed to that decision, right? They are not going into conflicts and argument, uh, go in argumentation with you, why it should be this and that. You just decide something, it should be that way. And as we are paying basically people for their knowledge and their experiences, we already waste money here, right? So, but you, you just decide things and then these people don't commit to that, what you have decided, because as, it, as I've said, they have no, they had no influence on that, at least that's what they feel. Then they avoid any accountability on that because it's like, hey, you decided that. If it fails, that's your fault, right? I was, I wanted to say how, how, it, how I think it should be, but you didn't listen to me or I didn't go into that because I was afraid that this could be um, to my bad. And then I don't pay any attention to results. Not that I'm not having goals, I have my own goals. And sometimes they have some intersections and, cross, uh, and overleaps, overlaps with, uh, with the team goals, but it might be I have completely different goals than my team. That's pretty worse, right? So um, the non-existence of trust is really the root of everything, but if we want to talk about trust, shouldn't we define trust? Like, what is trust? Um, and I tried to do that. When I prepared that talk, I tried to define trust in one or two sentences, something crisp 
something you can remember. And I miserably, I completely failed, which I found very odd because I experience trust every day, maybe every second. I know whom to trust, which things to trust, or where I don't have trust. But putting that feeling in like into a description where I think, yeah, that's something how I would see trust is extremely hard. And as an engineer, I also would like to measure things, right? This whole cultural thing and the whole DevOps movement is so fluffy. Couldn't we get just get some measures on these cultural things? How can we measure trust? And even there, I had no idea. But the good thing is we live in modern times. And if you don't have any clue, we ask Professor Wikipedia. And <laughs> Wikipedia has a long article about what trust is. And it's very comprehensive. And I just start with um, the first sentence of uh, how Wikipedia defines trust. I have to read that. Definitions of trust typically refer to a situation characterized by the following aspect. One party, truster, is willing to rely on the actions of another party, trustee. The situation is directed into the future. OK? Right? Sounds good. But it's like, OK, repeat that sentence, ah, it's a bit hard. Maybe we can find something shorter, something more that we can, that, that, that sticks to our mind. And I came up with, with that, or I found that definition by a, um, a paper by Dr. Dwey. And uh, that paper defines uh, trust as the state for readiness, the state of readiness for an unguarded interaction with someone or something. And I find that's a pretty good, like one sentence definition of what trust is. Uh, for me, that, that works out pretty well. And that paper also um, tells us how trust is constructed out of three elements. And these three elements are the capacity for trusting, the perception of competence, and the perception of intentions. What does that mean? Well, the perceptions of trust is, um, you know that. To have trust with someone or something, you always need to have a history with that someone or something, right? Um, I'll give you an example. When, I f when you fly the first time with the plane, the first time you go into the system of aviation, you go to, th to the airport, strange things happen. You have to wait a lot. You go to security, um, you queue up, then you enter a, a, a metal pipe with other foreigners that accelerate, then that pipe accelerates pretty hard, and then you go up into the air. Strange things happen, and you might have not really trust in that. There are a lot of people involved, a lot of technology, a lot of mechanics that could all go wrong. But it's like it's the first time you don't have any trust experience with that. If you have flown a hundred times, and it always worked out well, so you gain trust in that, in that system of aviation. So you, you take the plane and you trust that it will work out fine. But even if you have flown a hundred times, and I don't know about you, but when, when I enter a plane and I enter it, and then I have to turn right to, to my seat. I always have a look left. Sometimes the door is open where the, where the pilots are sitting. And then I check and they're like, okay, they're doing good. But what about if they like having a good time with a box of beer? And like, okay, maybe I've flown a hundred times, but I'm not sure whether these people in there are competent flying the plane right now. And then I would lose trust. Um, the third thing is like, okay, maybe I've flown a hundred times and I enter the plane, I turn left and they look like how pilots should look like, right? With this pilot classes and a bit like Tom Cruise and yeah. <laughs> so, I, so I turn left, I go to my seat and then I start thinking about what could happen now. And I think, well, maybe they are competent, but maybe they are too competent. Who tells me that they are not like, hey, let's do some crazy thing with the airplane. Maybe let's do some loops. Oh no, zero G. Like, oh, I'm not sure whether, maybe they are competent and everything was fine the last hundred times, but maybe their intentions are not bad, uh, uh, not good. And that would also ruin my trust. And I think with that, we have defined trust already quite well. And then I thought, I want to measure trust. How could we measure trust? And I came up with this. Trust is, you can measure trust in speed, like the speed in execution, like fast decision-making processes. How fast do you come to a decision? How fast do you execute, execute things? Like in our industry, how fast can you deploy? How fast can you recover services? If you always need to fill out Excels and ask some higher managers, most likely that's not very fast, right? But if you like work on a trust-based level, things are faster. And also there is a whole book about that. It's called The Speed of Trust by Stephen Covey. It's all kinds of industries, all kinds of situations where he talks about um, what trust does with, um, 
with, um, yeah, with groups and people if it just exists and it just accelerates stuff. And this is also nothing new. Like when I did this, or when we did these daily deliveries at SAP's, SAP, we used we needed to to file 229 forms with every change we did to the productive system, and then calling a meeting with all kind of higher paid persons um, that they could give us the go or no go whether we could release, and this took for sure weeks um, until we could do a change in the productive system, and. This is because there was a lot of con command and control in the process and less trust. So the more trust you have, the faster you come to decisions. And this is important for the DevOps thing because um, in DevOps we talk a lot about tools and um, pipelines and such things. And what about if you have a change in your source code and you have a pipeline and the deployment, everything is automated and that takes you a few minutes until something could be put it onto production service uh, server, but you are not allowed to because now you need to file out the Excels, call some persons, wait for some emails and such things, right? So if you only focus on the technology wise, you might be fast, but you can't leverage that speed because your organization cannot, um, cannot um, take up this speed um, because it's just, just too slow. And therefore you need to speed up your processes and in your organization. And this is why trust comes in, right? To have um, fast organizations you need to work with trust. So if trust is that important, the major question is how can we build trust? And this is, comes back now to what I've said at the very beginning, I'm not psychologist, whatever, I'm just a developer. What do you ask me? I have no clue how we can build trust. But I have some ideas how you can foster trust, right? Something that might come up at the end with, with more trust. And one thing is team size. Team size is very important, or looking into team sizes, because communication is important for trust. Um, if you are into project management, I hope you hopefully have read or heard of this book. Um, if you haven't, and you are into project management, please read the book. It's, it was actually plenty time to read it. It was published 75. If you want to read it fast, buy two copies of the book, then you can read it twice as fast. What the book says is adding manpower power to a late software project makes it even later, which is com completely um, contradicting our natural experience, right? If I dig a hole on the weekend and it takes me whole, a whole day to dig the hole, and next weekend I dig the same hole again, but I just call in a friend, then as a rule of thumb, it takes half a day to dig the hole. But in this crazy times of software engineering, if you have a team of 10 and you want to have it twice as fast, you add another team of 10, it doesn't go twice as fast, it doesn't work. And the reason why that is is communication. And Brooks comes up with, the, comes up with this intercommunication formula. It's that's basically the communication lines that you have between, um, between people, they go up by the square. So if you have three people in a team, it's three communication connections, with four it's already six connections, with five it's 10 connections and so on. So the magic question is here, okay, where does that break? Where is this overlap of communication takes over? that the efficiency of the whole, of the, the efficiency and the outcome of the team um, goes down. And this is where uh, this um, gentleman helps. Uh, Robin Dunbar, who is an anthropologist and evolutionary psychologist. Um, he came up with uh, the so-called Dunbar's number, and that is a cognitive limit to the number of people with whom one can maintain stable social relationships. Okay, what does that mean? Well. So Dunbar's number, first of all, is 150. So, so the average person can maintain 150 stable social relationships, right? The average person. That guy, as I said, he's a psychologist. They are into statistics. If you do the counting now for yourself and you end up with 140 or even 150, don't need to go to the doctor. You're all just fine. It's, it's, it's covered by statistics. It's 150 at, at the average. So what he did is basically he investigated all kind of social groups of, of people and he always found this 150 barrier. Um, so for example, if you look into stone aged man's villages, there are no stone aged man's cities, but only villages. And the largest of these stone aged man villages had a size that they can host like 150 people. The smallest technical unit of the Roman army the so-called money pail, has a size of 150. 
Even in modern armies, if you do the average across all these different weapon categories, whatever that the English word is, and you build the average, it's roughly 150. The Hutterites, which are a religious group um, living in Northern America, they um, emigrated from Southern Germany um, and um, moved to North America in the um, uh, 1900s. And then they live in so-called Bruderhof communities, which is like um, a self-containing community, like everyone works for the community. Uh, and they split up their community at the size of roughly 150. Why? Because they say if we exceed that too much, we can't guarantee that everyone in the, in the community um, has a value in what they are doing um, to the community, right? And you might also, you can also see that in, in business. You might know the Gore-Tex um, membrane, this water breath waterproof, breathable membrane used for outdoor jackets, trousers, such stuff. The company behind that Gore is actually, it's multiple companies. They split up all also at around the size of 150 because they say that helps them to prevent bureaucracies and hierarchies. So it's like many small companies that all work individually. So, but interestingly for us, for, for the trust reason, is what Dunbar, uh, how Dunbar puts this down. Dunbar says, the average, again, the average person has five intimate friends, 15 trusted friends, 35 close friends, and 150 casual friends. Everything that exceeds that is not a stable social relationship for most of the persons. And interestingly, interesting for us is these trusted friends, like 50. And this is already includes the, the intimate friends, the five intimate friends. So with that, we end up with 10. So 10 additional trusted, stable social relationship a person can have. And that's the scientific explanation why we always talk about teams of 10, why Jeff Bezos says, my teams are the size that you can feed them with two pizzas. <laughs> He's an American, he talks about American pizza, so it's roughly 10 people, <laughs> more or less. Um, so if your team, you are feeling, well, trust is bad because communication is bad, well, it's simply just because of the team size. It's too large to have trustful relationships with everyone who sh with whom you should have trustful, stable relationships. Not saying that in larger organizations, you can't have larger organizations. The question is just with whom should you have trustful, stable relationships? Um, just wait for the pictures. <laughs> Welcome. Um, the second um, pillar of our idea how you could foster trust is diversity. Because, believe it or not, even the geekiest, nerdiest person that you know is a social person. Because every human is a social person, right? And we want to socially interact. Some people more, some people less, sometimes more, sometimes less. But it's always about social interaction with other people. So that's the reason why you should never underestimate the power of an evening beer. I'm from Germany, that we have beer. You might have, I don't know, tapas or tea, whatever have you. So never underestimate this, these social events with, with colleagues because this, this, these are perfect to build relations uh, and are good for social interactions. And if you look into some um, hierarchies of organizations, they, they pretty much work like, sometimes work like that, where you have functional silos spread across the world and um, putting people miles and miles away and through very different time zones is a pretty bad idea because people seek, as I said, for social interactions. And I know now all the tool providers come, but we have Slack, we have video conferences, we have telephony, we have email, we have, I don't know, wiki pages, all sorts of communication that you can have. And that's great and you should do that, but that's communication. What I'm talking about is social interaction. And communication is part of social interaction, but it is not social interaction, right? So if you want to you know, follow the sun and have different locations worldwide, that's just fine. But remember what will happen to, to, these, peop to these people in their silos, because these silos and, and any, basically any arbitrary and virtually meaningless distinction between groups can, can separate people. That's based on the work of Henry Tafel. Uh, by the way, a very interesting biography, um, uh, very uh, um, fruitful to, to read his, his, his uh, biography. Um, he was into like, how, how are we feeling related to groups? 
how, where, how do groups exist at all and how do we feel related to them? Like there are formal groups, like you, you signed a contract most likely with your employer, so that's, that's a formal group. Like all the employees in your company, that's a formal group. A non-formal group is like, I don't know, you cheer up for some football club. I cheer up for Eintracht Frankfurt, who yesterday won for one in the EuroLeague, if you didn't know. Um, so I cheer up for them, but I didn't sign a contract with them. I'm just cheering up for them as you cheer up for, I don't know, Real Barcelona, uh, no, Barcelona, most likely not, um, Atletico. Um, so, but and you feel related to these folks just because you feel related, like we are having this all, we are part of that group. And, and, um, and the, the, the funny thing is that this, only happens like in these informal groups, like you feel related to that group, but there is no, you know, you don't know whether the others also have the same um, relation to that group or whether they see this group at all, whether that group exists for the others um, as well. And what he, he did some experiments and he found out that, as I said, virtually meaningless distinction between groups such as preferences for certain paintings or color of a shirt can trigger a tendency to favor one owns group to the expense of others, and that became known as the minimal group paradigm. So I give you an exa um, example, or the, the main experiment that he did that was repeated again and again with slight uh, modifications, but the result was always the same. So when you entered the room here, and we, we, we in this experiment, we, we, we put it that you don't know each other, right? We're all foreigners. You come in the room, and then I give you a red shirt or a green shirt. How do I do that? Well, I just flip a coin. I don't tell you, but I'm just flipping a coin whether you get a red or a green shirt. Then you're all having red or green shirts and you don't know why, but you have red and green shirts on. And then I say, okay, now you can, um, you can uh, promote um, um, uh, um, a reward to anyone. First option, you can give anyone in the room 100 euros, this, despite of whether they're having wearing red shirts or green shirts, just everyone gets 100 euros. Second option, Everyone with the same color shirt that you get 60 euros and the others get 40. Logically, you would say, well, everyone takes A because it's 100 euros for everyone, which is more than the 60 euros that my group gets here. Um, but you could imagine that's not what's happening. Most people choose B. They go for the second option because they want, they feel related to a group, even though they do not know why they are in that group because they just have a shirt on and I flipped the coin, did, um, finding out which shirt you wear. And I'm not saying you that we are now playing a game or whatever. No, it's just you disturb, you distribute, you distribute the money and then it's, that's it. So actually there's no reason in, in, in acting like that. But people feel related to that group and they want to give their group um, um, a better status than the other group, whatever that means. And coming back to what that brings to these organizations that we have here, that's a scientific explanation of all these us versus them, right? It's us, the business people who understand the customers, if just the development would do the right stuff. And the development people say, well, we are the tech people, we know how shit works. If they would just get us straight the, the requirements from the customer, then we would, could have fixed that problem and so on. We work, we are the US team, we are closer to the customer, we know it better now, but we are the Indian teams, we are work better. This is all related because of this. We feel related to groups that no one's most often, no one really said that there should be groups, but we feel related to that. And it's nothing to that we should feel bad about it. It's just something that happens. That's just how our brain works, right? And we just need to understand that it is like that. And this is why we are encouraging in DevOps often these cross-functional autonomous teams where we say, well, put everyone in, in the same, with the same um, f focus area, um, all people that work on one product or one component, put them in one team to have this again, this from aha to kaching, like uh, all these people, let them work together to have to spend the full end to end process and to optimize them. Because with that, they might still say, well, we are the team of product A. We want to be the best, we want it to be the best product, highest quality, most secure product in the world. Not bad from a business reason. Yeah, that's what we want. You know, no fighting, just keeping, the, making the product good. And it's important that it's like all the people, like all the skins, like this, that these are diverse team because it's, as I said, from the aha to the kaching. <clears throat> and the reason for that is, um, and now comes some little magic. Um, I want you to think about a successful team, being it in culture, in sports, in, from the business, in private life. Think about teams that you think that they are successful. And because I have this magic gift 
of reading your mind. All these information stream into my head and I can tell you all the teams that you think about, they are heterogeneous. Successful teams are always heterogeneous. Think about it. Think about football teams only consisting of goalkeepers or rock bands consisting only of bass players. Maybe even that, maybe that is interesting, but definitely something you would like to hear all day long, right? Successful teams, successful groups are always heterogeneous when everyone come and bring in their skills and their knowledge, their experience, their background. That works best. Um, the third pillar of how to foster trust is um, safety. Uh, and safety comes in, in various forms. The one is um, a failure culture and the other one is psychological safety. I will come to that all in a, in a second. First part here, I want to talk about failure tolerance and a failure culture. Um, if you have studied uh, informatics, some IT, something technical stuff, you know what that is. That's RAID 1 system. It's basically mirroring of data. Um, it's what you get in one of the first classes when you do um, IT studies. It's like, it basically says, um, technical resources are about to fail. They will fail, you have to, ex you have to deal with that. And if that's business uh, data, so critical data, or even the pictures of your loved ones, it might be a good idea to just mirror the data. So if one of these two disks fail, well, still the second disk is there and it could um, serve its purpose. Or you do backups, recoveries, you do HD, all the HA, high availability stuff, because people told you and you believe and you know that technical resources will fail and you have been trained in getting to, to work along that. At least in my education, no one ever told me how to deal with failures of people. And no one told me how to deal with my very own failures. Because failure, why should someone tell me about failures? Failures are something bad, right? We, shouldn't, we should avoid failures. That's what project management was invented for, right? We are here, we want to go there. I've drawn a straight line. I identified all the traps side, um, sideways. You just need to follow that path and then we, have re can, we will reach success. Did that ever work? Like project plans that exceed more than, let's say, two weeks or so, like two years or so, did they ever work? No, they never worked because they cannot foresee the future. And we are dealing with complex problems. If you are dealing with simple problems or with uh, complicated problems or chaotic problems, there might be a different way how you should approach these problems. But if you have complex problems, and that's what mostly we solve in IT, you go the iterative way. That's what all the agile people talk about. Do the iterative way. So you do something, then you measure the situation is now better. Yes, so okay, go ahead in that path. If not, change something and try something else. So basically what you do is you stumble from one failure to the another, right? And at the end, you reach something that you would, at a later point in time, would call success. That's also important. Failure and success are always terms that we use when we talk about the past, right? We know that was a failure. We have, should have decided that the other way. Um, oh, that was a really good success. We are happy with that. But we never rate failure or successes directed into the future. We hope for success, maybe, but really have the rating we can only do in the past. And in complex problems, we go in iterations, and iterations mean do failures, learn from them, and then um, go ahead. There is uh, one anecdote that I want to share with you. This is um, Thomas J. Watson, who was like the first real CEO of IBM. And at the very early years of, of uh, IBM, IBM was involved in a 10 million business opportunity. So there was a deal which was about to be signed the contract. It wasn't signed the contract, but about to sign the contract. And that deal would have been the largest deal for IBM at that time. And they um, assigned a new hired sales representative on that opportunity. And that new hired sales representative did a mistake and the opportunity was gone. So the contract was not closed and the 10 millions um, didn't make it to IBM. Um, I, honestly, I never found out what, what the mistake was. I, I found many, um, uh, many times, uh, many books, this, this, uh, this anecdote, but it was never really described what that failure was. But anyways, so that sales representative did a, did a failure. IBM didn't get the $10 million. Next day, that sales representative had an appointment in the office of Thomas J. Watson. Um, and so the, the person already you know, packed all the stuff, um, wrote his termination. He went into the office of Watson, said, okay, here's my termination. I think with that, we are done. Thank you very much. And then Watson replied, no, I'm not going to fire you. I just spent $10 million in your education. I'm sure not going to fire you. 
Brie was a pretty smart guy. I mean, emotionally, I, I'm pretty sure he was upset in losing the $10 million for his company. But what are the logical options? Well, I'm sure you could fire that guy. Most likely, he would then um, get hired by some uh, competitor or some other company. And he would, what, what, we, what we can be sure that this person will never do that mistake again. Well, why not keeping that person inside the company and maybe even having that knowledge of what we shouldn't do spread in the company and make the company immune, somehow immune to that kind of failure. This is how our immune system works. That's why I use the term immune, right? You could use failures as a learning opportunity and make your organization immune against certain failures. And, and this all... Um, so you need to have leaders that, that foster trust and that foster is something that is called psychological safety. I started this talk and said I wanted to know why there are some teams are like high performing and other teams are just okay, okay, -ish, maybe even low performing, if that, that's a strange term, but right? there are differences in teams. Why is that? And funny enough, Google had the same question around 2012. It's just that Google had a little bit more resources than I and so they hired all kinds of um, scientists to find out, listen, we have, we have experienced that we have some teams that are high performing and we have other teams that are just okay. And we want to know the secret sauce of the high performing teams because if we know that, then we could spread the secret sauce on all our teams and our company would go boom, that would be really good. So they had all kinds of hypotheses and tried to find out why are some teams so good. Um, at the end, they, they found out what something that they call psychological safety. Um, and this is the most critical part, more than any other parameter that they found out that, um, that uh, indicated whether a team is successful or not. And psychologically, safety simply means that people share weaknesses and personal vulnerabilities amongst each other. So um, that is something where you hear people, especially leaders, say a sentence like, I don't know. I can't decide this, I need your help. We need to decide this together because I don't know, I need help on this. I have a problem here. Hey, I'm scared. Hey, listen, I, I have really a problem to, um, at home with my kids. Um, you, you, you can't count on me this week, maybe like that. So like sharing your vulnerabilities makes the most other people go into the same direction. Like, okay, let, let's share my vulnerabilities too. Let's share where I'm struggling with. And this, this understanding that you, you, know, you don't have any um, super man or super woman inside the team, Mr. or Mrs. know-it-all, um, and that everyone you know, has, has their own struggles, brings that team uh, into a trustful relationship um, and what they call psychological safety. And that um, is the root of um, high-performing teams, according to that study. This was done, as I said, um, 2012, and that is a of publishing in the New York Times Magazine uh, 2016. And this is, the important thing here is also, it's like a shout out to the leaders. I mean, everyone is important um, for, for building trust in an organization, but the leaders are in this sweet spot of ruining trust um, with just sometimes one word or just one action. So in, in a leader, you are in a very um, um, exposed position. Um, and if you don't come up with this behavior of how to be to create um, psychological safety or trust, um, that is a problem because um, in his book, um, Reinventing Organizations, which is all about how should organizations work in the future and how should we work in the future, um, Frederic Laloux had this one sentence where he says, an organization cannot evolve beyond its leadership stage of development. And that's with everything. Like if you do the agile thing or psychological safety, if your leaders do not buy into that, well, that's like, you know, that's the maximum level that your, that your organization can lead to. If they are fully buying into that, showing their vulnerabilities, uh, really work the agile way, then your team can, can go to that stage, but they cannot go beyond that stage. That's why it's so important for leaders to understand how, how trust works, how psychological safety works, um, and all these things. And this is already my recap slide. So um, when you want to foster trust, Think about team size, think about good communication, and good communication is different than um, social interactions. Social interactions are, are very important um, in, um, in to having, it's also to have diverse teams um, where everyone you know, can bring in um, her or his skills uh, and their knowledge. 
um, and think about the psychological safety. When have you last heard from one of your leaders? I don't know um, such things. When did you as a leader last time say, I have a problem, I can't decide this alone. Um, I don't want to decide this on my own. Um, these are the things that, that, that foster trust. And with that, um, that's one of the few Spanish words I know. Gracias. <laughs> Are there any questions? I think we have four minutes or so uh, until there's the break. Yeah. Oh, can I use the microphone? Hi. Um, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I think I've never uh, seen the trust um, thing explained it this way, and I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. That's first. And then um, I work as a product manager. And um, I would like to know uh, if you have any advertisement for for someone like me. Like uh, when you say that maybe the best solution to give this trust uh, it would be to make a team of one of every uh, people in the different teams. Uh, will it be this like the best approach for a product manager? Because at the end, I have to talk with all different. Uh, people in these different teams, so. Um, it's at least at, uh, one approach that um, we do in our company, and I think that works out pretty fine. And I think important here is less like the organization structure that you need to have an organization like that, as long as you ensure that people work in like a virtual organization like that, right? Um, that is more important than uh, putting the people like putting up an organization like that, but not giving the people, the, for example, the freedom and the autonomy to decide on their own. Then, okay, then you have the organizational, but you might not that, that might not fit in other roles. But um, from from my experience, from my very own experience, um, that is that really helps to what I had in the second part of people focusing on the product and not talking about. But I'm the product manager. Like, why are you saying you're a product manager? Like, you should say, I work, I, we create product X, Y, Z, and we think it's the best product in the market for doing this. But you, you explain yourself as like, I'm the product manager. Like, yeah, okay, and then I know your role, and I might have an idea of what your daily business might look like. But basically, your work focus should be, what is it that we want to solve for the customers, right? And that's the product or services, whatever you, you, you create. And um, that you can foster, again, um, by, by having everyone aligned to like, this is why we are here for. And I don't care, honestly, if you are doing development or operations. Maybe you do today more development, tomorrow you do a little operations. Then this whole um, distinction between, but, but that's an operations job, it's not my job, it, it's completely gone because, no, it is, it is the product that we're all here to, to serve on. Um, and uh, or the product manager, like, hey, but testing is not my not my thing. I mean, I write the backlog items, but testing, you know, we have queue people for that. No, I, I want it to, to be a good product. And if I can help out the people in testing, yeah, I do so if I can help there. Because it's all focusing on something and relating to some group that, that is helpful for the business. Okay, because uh, what I've seen is that it's getting better uh, with just doing these meetings with all the different people uh, in the teams and just talking or, or giving them time to talk in between them and going through, you know, having the same um, objective, which is uh, build a better product, each one in the different role that they have. But yeah, what I've seen is just talking is, is giving them a lot of a lot more uh, empowerment of building mm -hmm. one or yeah. doing the right thing. Okay. And, and, and talking also, uh, also talking about non-business topics. Like when I see going, people going to lunch, um, it, I see, oh, that's the development group that goes to lunch, uh, and there are sort of product managers that go to lunch. And or evening events like, yeah, we do the company outing, we are the ops people. Like, no, you should do the company outing with like everyone. Like, these, these kind of thinking of like, not, 
I'm not taking pride in, in being the developer or the architect for, for the product. I'm taking pride in, in being part of the team that tries to create the product. The product is the, is the highest thing that, that, we, that we all align on. That's our part of our identity, rather than being in this location, that location, this role, that role. The roles are just following the needs of what you need to create the product. Gracias. <laughs>